Hello, this is Bowie Maker. I wanted to do a video about western action shooting and cowboy action shooting. I've been involved with this for several years now and when I mention it to my friends they seem to either have no idea what I'm talking about or they have the wrong idea of what it is. So I wanted to make a video that explains a little bit about what it is, what it is not, and what you need to get started if you want to give it a try. First of all, I'll tell you what it is not. A lot of people think when I mention cowboy action shooting, they say, oh, fast draw. No, I'm not talking about fast draw. That is, there is a cowboy fast draw association, and that's where they time their events, see how fast they can draw their gun and hit a target with a wax bullet. That's not what I'll be talking about in this video. There's also a cowboy mounted shooting association. This is where they ride on horseback over a course and they're shooting balloons with uh, blank black powder blanks. Um, again, that's not what this video is about. What this video will be about is cowboy action shooting and western action shooting. This is an event where participants shoot real bullets at steel targets in a timed event. Now I want to make a very important distinction here. There are two national groups that sanction these events. And the national groups have charter clubs or posses throughout the United States. The first and the largest of these two organizations is SAS, or the Single Action Shooting Society. The second is NCALS, or the National Congress of Old West Shootists. Now while both of these groups do a similar type of cowboy shooting, there are some very important and very distinct differences between the two. And it's important to understand the differences before you go and buy any equipment because what's allowed in one organization may not be allowed in the other. And I'll explain that as we go along. Both SAS and NCALS, when you shoot a stage or a round of competition, you start shooting when a buzzer sounds, and then you're timed until that last shot. Then they add a penalty for missed targets or other infractions. Typically you have to shoot the targets in a certain order, so if you shoot them out of order that would be a penalty. And the penalties in SAS, if you miss a target, they add five seconds to your time. With NCALS, if you miss a target, they add ten seconds to your time. So NCALS, you know, it, it kind of pays you, uh, if you're really worried about your time, to take a second or two to aim your gun rather than take a ten second penalty for a miss. First, let me talk a little bit about SAS. SAS requires four guns to compete. Two pistols, a lever action rifle, and a shotgun, typically a double barrel shotgun. SAS is all about speed shooting. As I said, they've got two pistols loaded with five rounds each, they've got a lever action rifle loaded with ten rounds, they've got a shotgun loaded with two rounds, and you'll have to reload and shoot two more rounds. That's a total of 24 rounds from four different guns. The best SAS shooters can do that in under 15 seconds. Now obviously to get that kind of speed you need a little help. They do modify their guns for speed. They do things like what they call short stroking. On your rifle, whereas a standard rifle, I have to work that lever all the way to here and then pull it back. With a short stroked rifle I might only have to move it to here. This is a modification that just saves a fraction of a second. With the pistols, you see how the hammer is on this pistol. Well they often modify these to bring this hammer out and down lower because when they're shooting they're basically holding the trigger down and just thumbing the hammer. Just so you know, 
fanning the guns like they do in Old West movies is not allowed in either organization. NCALS, on the other hand, is more about historical accuracy. And the targets typically are much further away than they are with a SAS match. But NCALS is really about being authentic to the Old West period. And that's from the end of the Civil War to the turn of the century, or 1866 to 1900. So nothing is allowed as far as guns or your outfit that was not actually used in that time period. So NCALS is much more about being historically accurate Plus, they do not allow modifications of the guns. They don't allow the race guns. Anything, the short stroking or changing the hammers, any type, that type of thing to give you more speed is not allowed. So what do you need to get started in cowboy action shooting? Well, obviously, you're going to need some guns. As I said, with SAS, you need four guns. You need two pistols, a rifle, and a shotgun. With NCALS, you can shoot with one pistol and a rifle. You can shoot three guns with two pistols and a rifle. Or if you prefer, you can shoot four guns with two pistols, rifle, and shotgun. There are shooting classes for just about anything you want to shoot. Also, you can shoot black powder or smokeless powder cartridges. Now, one caveat with both organizations is the rifles and pistols all must be pistol caliber. Now in SAS you'll typically see them shooting 38 caliber and a very mild load. Not very powerful because they're not really concerned with power or distance. They're more concerned with speed. So the milder load that you can shoot, the less recoil you have. And don't have to spend as much time getting back on target because the gun doesn't bounce. Where in cows, since they're more concerned with historical accuracy, you'll see a lot more people shooting 45 caliber, or really the more historical accurate um, 4440 caliber. You see a lot more people shooting black powder cartridges because that's really what they had back in the day. Smokeless powder didn't come about in common use anyway until after 1900. So in cows gives you the options. To shoot 38 or 45 uh, smokeless or black powder simply because black powder is uh, a little harder to find some in some places. Ammunition that's historically correct like 4440 is a little harder to find, a little more expensive. So they do make some concessions in that and for example I typically shoot 45 caliber in both my pistol and the rifle. Now in reality, the rifles of the day were not chambered in 45 caliber. Uh, the cartridge was a little different and they really couldn't make it work in the lever action rifles. So the rifles were really 4440 caliber. The Colt single action army pistols were 45 caliber. But today it's more common to find a lever action rifle in 45 caliber, caliber as 4440 is just simply not very common anymore. So what do you need to get started in western action shooting or cowboy action shooting? And I'll point out why I'm making that distinction. They're basically the same thing. However, SAS has trademarked the phrase cowboy action shooting. So NCALS and other organizations tend to say western action shooting. Basically means the same thing. So again, what do you need to get started? Obviously you need some guns, some period correct guns from the 1866 to 1899 time frame. Start with pistols. The most common gun you'll find in western action shooting is an original or a copy of the Colt Single Action Army, also known as the Peacemaker. This is a single action revolver where you do have to cock the hammer every time you fire a round. There, and even though this is a six shooter, 
we're always loading five rounds into the gun. This is a safety factor so that when the gun is loaded, the hammer's resting on an empty chamber. That way, if you should fumble the gun or drop it and it hits the hammer, there is not a live round under the hammer, so it cannot fire. Now, this is a Ruger Vaquero, which is a pretty good copy of the Colt Single Action Army. There's other ones, um, some excellent copies are made by Italian companies such as Uberti and Pieta. Uh, they're readily available. This is 45 caliber, although you can get them in multiple calibers. And that's what you'll uh, most commonly see. There's, there's actually a wide range of guns available that were used in the time period. There's Smith & Wesson Model 3s, which were a top brake pistol. Um, another, and really one of the cheapest ways to get into it, is with a black powder cap and ball pistol. This is 1858 Remington. This is the 1860 Colt Army. And actually these were quite common in the Old West because they were left over from the Civil War. Cartridge pistols didn't come around to 1873. So throughout the Civil War and particularly in the early periods of the Old West immediately after the Civil War, these were the most common guns. Now these are cap and ball pistols, so rather than a cartridge, you do have to pour powder into the chamber, put a lead ball on it, take your ramrod, ram that ball down into the chamber on each of the six chambers, or five chambers as we would do, and then you have to put a percussion cap on here to make it fire. So obviously it's a little more trouble, a little more time consuming. Now later on, the factories did convert these to cartridge guns, where they replace the cylinder with a one that accepts cartridges. And in fact, if you buy one of these guns today, you can buy conversions to make these cartridge guns. But I say these are one of the cheapest ways to get into it. You can buy these new for around $200. Whereas something like this would typically run you more in the five to six hundred dollar range. Then for rifles, primary rifles that would be available in the day were the 1860 Henry, the Winchester 1866. The most common one is the gun that won the West, the Winchester 1873, or Model 73, and the Winchester 92, which as a Model 92 would imply, it came out in 1892. There's also a Marlin 1894. Uh, so those are basically your lever action rifles you'd be looking at. Now it's important to note, they must be pistol caliber and most commonly they're 45 caliber. Uh, although in SAS they are probably more commonly used in 38 caliber. But uh, this is a uh, Rossi made in Brazil, but it's a, a really accurate copy of the 1892 Winchester. And there's a lot of them available. Um, this particular rifle you can find it new for around $600. Some of the others, uh, you know, really high grade Winchester 93 copy might run you $1,100. So there's a pretty wide range. Of course, there's always good deals on used guns. And then you may or may not need a shotgun. And typically, what's most commonly used is a double barrel short coach gun. You can get these with or without the exposed hammers. But they're simply a double barrel shotgun. There are a couple of other models that are allowed. There was a pump action shotgun, I believe it was a model 1897. And um, there actually was a lever action shotgun. But the double barrel coach gun is by far the most commonly used. So once you've got your guns, then you need an outfit. 
And this is another area where sass and NCALs tend to differ quite a bit. Sass, you'll find a lot of people portraying the Hollywood cowboys, the TV cowboys from the 50s and 60s. And a lot of us grew up with Bonanza and Gunsmoke and Bat Masterson, Have Gun, Will Travel. I like to portray those type of characters. However, this is one area where you'll find a lot of differences between the Hollywood cowboy and the real cowboy of the day. Uh, for example, in the Hollywood cowboy, the, the TV westerns and the movies, the gunslingers always had the low slung holsters tied down to their leg. Uh, rather than the holster sitting on the belt like this, it actually attached to a loop down below the belt so it get ride real low. That is purely a Hollywood invention. Never, never actually existed back in the day. So this is an area where with NCALs, the low slung holsters and fast draw holsters are not allowed because they are not historically accurate. So that's another area where you really need to decide which group you're going to shoot with before you start buying guns and, and your outfit. But, uh, you know, you can get a gun belt. As I said, the holster sits on the belt. You may or may not have cartridge loops on it. The pants, blue jeans, unmodified blue jeans would not be allowed in NCALs because pants in the day did not have belt loops. They did not have zippers. Snaps hadn't been invented yet. So the pants, they ride, typically ride a little higher and they're supported with suspenders or braces as they called them in the day. The shirts were typically not all the way buttoned down shirts. They were pullover shirts that might have two or three buttons. The pants and shirts all tended to be a little long, a little large, kind of a one size fits all to some extent, but uh, that's just the way they did it. The shirts, uh, you notice a lot of people wear sleeve garters. That's to help hold the sleeves up because the sleeves tend to be long. Typically want a vest, and the main reason is the vests give you pockets. In the old west, shirts may or may not have had a pocket. Pants had pockets, but if you were sitting in the saddle, you couldn't get to your pockets. So people wore vests, so they have their pockets, have things conveniently handy to them. The bandana, common thing with the old west cowboy, served a lot of purposes. You're out in the dust storm. It act as a mask, or if you were a bank robber, it would work too. And then, of course, a cowboy hat. And that's another distinction between the Hollywood cowboy and the Old West cowboy. The modern rodeo style hats simply did not exist in the Old West, although there were several different styles of hats that were available. And basically, in the Old West, but you wanted just, basically just wanted something with a wide brim. But there were bowlers, there were, this is a, called a Gus hat. Um, there were more flat top hats, cause some people call them a Colburn. So there's a lot of variety there. And, you know, there's, there's outfitters who sell historically accurate clothing, uh, such as Hamilton Dry Goods. You can look them up online. They, they have some pretty good deals. You can get, uh, pants and shirt and socks and suspenders for 70 bucks. Uh, shop your Goodwill store. Uh, a lot of times you can find a vest or a coat or a jacket, something that, uh, even a hat, that uh, could be period correct and get it at a bargain. Um, some people buy blue jeans and modify them. They did have blue jeans back in the day, back as early as 1848, 49 but they, uh, they were button fly and they did not have belt loops. People didn't wear belts until after the turn of the century. Uh, so you can get a pair of jeans and remove the belt loops and do some modifications. Then you need some cowboy boots. And there's a variety of choices there too. These are some I bought from one of the uh, historically correct clothing stores. They're called preacher boots. And you see they come up almost to the knee. 
you can get something like this, which is historically correct, pretty much. They wore boots like these in the Civil War. And one of the dis distinguishing features you're looking for is you want the square toe and a plain toe. Modern cowboy boots with the pointy toe and fancy stitching on them didn't exist back in the day. So if you want to be historically accurate, you want the square toe and plain toe. Actually, these were a pair of modern boots that most people call them hog boots. They had a leather strap that came around there and a big brass ring on the side. But I bought these for 75 bucks, I think. Cut the straps off and they're good historical reproductions of cowboy boots. And it should be noted that not all cowboys wore boots. Most did, but people did wear shoes. Uh, so you can do a little research and look at what people actually wore to get historically correct outfits. And bear in mind, not everybody was a cowboy on the range. There were bankers, storekeepers, bartenders, undertakers, doctors, and dentists, and all types of characters that you can portray that would be period correct to the Old West. So. Basically, that's what you need to get started. Um, it is somewhat expensive to get into in the sense that, you know, the guns aren't cheap. But the thing is, all your expense is up front. Once you've bought your guns and your outfit, from then on, your expense is just, made, just ammunition. And that's where a lot of people will get into reloading their own ammunition because that can save you about half the cost of buying it off the shelf. So, and you consider in a typical match, you're going to shoot five stages. Depending on how many guns you're shooting, you'll shoot 15, 20 rounds per stage. So you might shoot 100 rounds in a match. Um, so, you know, that's a consideration that uh, you multiply that by how many matches you're going to shoot, see how much ammo, ammo you're going to shoot in a season. Um, and it may, may well pay you to start reloading. You can get into reloading outfits for $150, $200, and it does save you a lot of money in the long run. So that's basically what you need to get into western action shooting or cowboy action shooting. It's a lot of fun. It's a good family activity. We have a lot of couples and often they bring their children along. Uh, it's a very safe activity. We take safety very seriously and take a lot of steps to ensure that everything is done safely at the matches. So if you've ever been thinking about it, go to a match, try it out. People are happy to let you shoot their guns see what you like, and get more information about it. But come on out, we hope to see you at a match soon. This is Boymaker, we'll see you at a match.